My name is Lenore von Stein, and this is another episode of The Facts. And tonight, we, this is a un, very unusual episode in that we're going to be talking to three of the crew members of The Facts. This is backstage at The Facts. Um, so uh, r right now, Scott Henkel's sitting next to me. He's a, a, a new audio guy on The Facts. Um, and um, uh, so, so w w why did you... Why did you, how did you find us? Why did you, why are you doing this? Um, I mean, for the facts uh, particularly, I was, uh, it was, I was getting close to graduation uh, from college and I was looking for opportunities to stay involved in uh, radio and TV production and for the TV film side, uh, you know, a good side of course is Mandy.com and so I saw uh, the advertisement you put on there and, you know, thought it would be a good opportunity to stay involved with, you know, producing TV in a studio and working, you know, with audio for TV. So I responded to it and thought it would be a good place to continue developing my skills in that area. But Ivanhoe is just uh, like a hero, you know. He, he, he rides in, and, and, and <laughs> we have nobody working in the control room. We have nothing, you know. How, 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 what, what, is your, what is your thing? What, you're, you're a cameraman, and, and uh, you, you're do, working freelance. And right, I freelance in camera, you know, video camera and film. I also do location sound for shorts or features. Whoever wants to hire me for it. Um, and I actually kind of directing, well, directing it in shorts, but the television show, your television show, was actually the first show I actually directed as a show doing live cameras, taking on the fly. Yeah, and you're doing very well. You know, you know. sometimes we have to have, like right now, these static cameras, and you're not in the room right now. You're out here, and, you know. Uh, so so um, what, what has been your experience on this show, or uh, what... Yeah, I didn't even have to answer that. You know, what, what's what's been your what do you what do you? How can it be made better? And what are the issues working here, working on the show, working at the station? I think one of the issues, which I always try to look at both the positive and the negative side negative side of things, I think one of the issues that we have is you know the lack of staff most of the times. And sometimes they take on multiple roles at one time, and it's best for the production to have like one person take one role, such as switching, another person take one role, robotic cameras, another person man the, you know, the real camera in here in the studio. And even though that can be somewhat intimidating and it could cause problems, um, it makes you think, and it also helps you to grow because you are stuck. It's like, okay, you want to make the best product possible to have the best production possible. So you're just forced to think on the fly. It's like, okay, I gotta do two people at one time, three people at one time, or else is it gonna fall flat? And it kind of pushes you to the limit to do your best. Which pushes you to the limit? If Having to, to do, do more, more than one yeah. job? And then when you do be able to do one job, you say, thank God. <laughs> okay, I don't have to go nuts, and I can concentrate on this, and you already know what's going on. You could actually call back on some of the mistakes that you made and say, okay, I know when I did this all in one shot, I made this mistake, this mistake. I could concentrate on this, I could advise someone not to do this, or advise them to try to do that. It could be very helpful. Well, sometimes you, you, you've been doing this really nice stuff where you, where you fade one picture into another and, and, or juxtapose people that are sitting here and sitting there. You know, suddenly they seem to be sitting next to each other and that's, it's, 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 it's been really nice watching you Thanks. watching you develop these this this style and I remember the one of the last shoots when the facilitator from m and came in and said you couldn't put the camera over there because you're going to see the back of somebody's head or the profile and you did yeah. see the back of their head and you did see their profile and but so what you know it's it's um, right. it was because I wanted to get a certain shot of you especially when certain people were talking and it's almost like you like kind of like peeking in almost like you're looking at something you're not supposed to like catching a moment of you like in the background, you just snuck into the studio. He's like, "What's going? 
okay, oh, that's her reaction when she's listening to this person's answer. Oh, okay. I want to get that feeling. I didn't want just like the regular static, okay, that's a shot there, shot there. I wanted to get some kind of emotion going in. You know, on this last shoot that we did with the, the, the torture episode, and you caught my reaction sometimes, was, and I, I was, I, <laughs> I, 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 because I, 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 I don't know what to do with my face sometimes. You know, I, you know, I, I, I want to be present, you know, I'm present, right. you know, thinking, you know, but at the same time, I'm just, <laughs> um, so you caught that, and, and I've seen you do that before, and sometimes it makes me, it, it causes me anxiety, but I have kind of put that anxiety away and say, well, you know, this is, a, this is, because this is what I'm always looking for is the, is the eye of the, of the people who are looking. I have to put that away. This is part of the artwork, you know. I, I wouldn't have looked at my face just then, but maybe when I look at this, you know, five years from now or two years from now, I'll appreciate it even more, you know. It's, it's, it's um, you know, I'm just a piece of the picture. Um, part of the whole. All of these people at this point are volunteering, as are we, because uh, money. Hello, Jonathan De La Rosa, camera guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so um, you 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 you're very unusual in that you like modern music, and that's uh, uh, so unfortunately unusual. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> uh, and because um, we you know we do modern music here, but it's yeah. you know it's, it's like you're doing I don't know what you know, it's it's really underappreciated. Yeah. Um, it's true. Um, so how come you were, how come you came to this show? I mean, you know, you looked it up in Mandy, and you're looking for. Uh... Well, at the time, I was a uh, logging intern at Redline Films, which was a, a production company. Well, is a production company down in a uh, Lower Manhattan, Soho area, right? You know, channels like Discovery, Bravo, et cetera, basically outsource production for certain programs to them, and and so what we did was we took the raw footage from a day shoot and we transcribed it into a script that the editors could use to fashion into an actual uh, you know program and at the time I was thinking well this is good for you know getting kind of the op getting experience in the office side of production kind of the bureaucratic well not even bureaucratic just you know sort of the post office kind of white collar aspect of the job but I wasn't really getting enough uh, actual hands-on production experience and you know, at the time, my resume was you know pretty anemic, so I felt that this was a good opportunity to get some really hands-on experience with actual you know studio equipment and whatnot, right? And I also liked the idea of a show that could bring new music to a wider, potentially uh, even just a slightly wider audience. <laughs> slightly wider. Slight, slightly, you know, yeah. yeah, I mean, and you certainly have gotten hands-on experience here. Oh, absolutely, because, yes. Because so, some of the problems in working on this show. Uh, well, sometimes we're understaffed, you know, especially on weekends when people, you know, have other plans and they can't commit. So, you know, you have to improvise, think on your feet, you know, especially in the control room when you don't have enough hands, hands, that tongue-tied to uh, run everything. But you, you've done very well, haven't you? you? I suppose I have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to make your own movies or? I would love to one of these days, you know, I... I've have written some partial scripts, I've written some full scripts. My computer crashed, so most of the stuff I wrote is stuck in that hard drive that's halfway dead, I'm planning to get it out. Um, but eventually, yes, I would like to, because um, I always had the saying when I first decided to go into filmmaking. It wasn't like some people make like a split judgment decision, oh, I'm gonna make films now. I'm gonna do. It was like a, a gradual thing. Not gradual, but I said, you know what, I see things on television. They should have this story on television, they should have that, or oh, this could be done better. And I took my time with it. I was working as a project manager and a specifier in contract for furniture industry. My original degree was in architecture. And I wasn't really fulfilled with it. It wasn't satisfying. You know, the money was great, but it just wasn't here. And little by little, I started doing research on filmmaking. I started buy buying books to read. I started looking up schools, what the programs are about, little by little. So it wasn't a snap judgment. It was something that came over time, but I knew this was something I was definitely going to do. It wasn't just a fad. And as I progressed into it, from saying, gee, I just want to make films, I started realizing what kind of power these films can have. And I decided as a filmmaker, you have stories out there 
that have been told, or something to me, you have stories out there that haven't been told, that need to be told, and you have stories out there that have been told but need to be retold properly. And that's my goal as a filmmaker to do in the future. Getting involved in audio in general, I was actually uh, 17 years old and I was listening to overnight radio, uh -huh. you know, an overnight radio program. Overnight is 2 to 6 a.m. Uh, during one summer uh, after my junior year of high school. And I was listening to All Night with Jason Smith, which is actually a sports program. But he, the way he told this one story um, about, because uh, he was relating a piece of news about a football player named Matt Leinert, who was um, being accused of being a deadbeat dad. And the way the host was, you know, relating that to his own story and the way he told that story and how I was able to relate to the feelings despite not having ever been in that same circumstance, I wanted to get into radio and, you know, tell stories and uh -huh. work with producing stories, you know, theater of the mind. We share two things aside right. from this. We we like movies. We like movies. And we yeah. like uh, new music. Yes. And uh, um, uh, uh, we were talking about Drive, which we both really dug. Oh, I love that movie. And um, so you're, what, what, what do you want to do? I'd like to direct, ideally. Direct films? Yeah. You want to write them or? Uh, it'd be nice to write them. You have more creative control. You know, ideally, assuming producers don't step in and go, well, you know, America's parents don't want to see a side boob in a PG film or something, or some crap like that, you know? So it's it's really the visual moving, the, the yeah. creating a composition, yeah. a visual composition? Uh, something that's always interested me is uh, kind of the dividing line between uh, something that is representational and something that just goes off into pure abstraction, right, visually like uh, how Godard treats um, advertisements and two or three things I know about her, or how Antonioni treats uh, industrial structures in Red Desert, for example. That really interests me aesthetically. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've never liked... Um, how does he treat industrial things in Red Desert? I don't remember. They're very stark, monumental, you know, like almost like, a, like shapes on a kind of a abstract expressionist canvas, it feels like. But there's a, but there's never any doubt that there's also repre uh, representational quality, not just on a simple narrative level, but you know, on a subtextual level as well. So th that kind of fuzzy area really interests me. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's really, I mean, the the composition, any kind of composition, any kind, is any really, kind it's of really, it's really, yeah. it's, yeah, it's really, um, th you know at least a three-dimensional chess game, if yeah. not more than that, you know. And you know, always a pain, you know. Always a what? Always a pain. Like, uh, I learned that the hard way when I was working in my, uh, well, I went to uh, Ramapo College in New Jersey for a BA in Communications Arts uh, concentration in digital filmmaking. I really learned the hard way what a pain uh, blocking and lighting are when you have limited resources and limited space. Like, like people, you know, a lot of, you know, People who want to get into the field have this attitude of, well, I can just pick up a camera and make a movie and it'll look fine. No, it won't. Because you really need, need the, uh, not just the resources, you know, at least a minimum of, of low, but of even, you know, crappy low budget resources. But you also need the ability to improvise, think on your feet and really take advantage of what little space you have. Mm -hmm. It's all about taking advantage of space. Mm-hmm. Like a painter. Yeah. Like not just, you know, compositionally, but in terms of actual practice, because you really need to be able to think outside the box if you want to make something look good, or if you're working on a low budget, or in the case of, you know, my crappy college art projects, zero budget whatsoever. We've got a kind of a zero budget here, but we've got some <laughs> equipment, you know. Yeah. Uh, and we've got this space, and we've got some, you know, really talented people working on this show. Um, can you give me an example of a story? I'll tell you one example. There are a lot of old cowboy stories, okay, from the old Wild West that you've seen from like in the 40s and the 50s coming through and everything. And a lot of it is so 
inaccurate in regards to Native Americans, in regards to African Americans. For example, you hear cowboys. Cowboys are the big heroes and everything. Um, people don't realize that originally cowboy was a derogatory term. Okay, because the original cowboys were like basically the Mexicans and freed slaves. And they couldn't just call them, you know, they couldn't call them boys, you know. Instead of saying, hey, boy, go get this, since they wrangle the cows, hey, cowboy, come do this. Cowboy, come do that. A lot, a lot of history is missing that people don't grab. Okay, a lot of things have been basically wiped out. So to appeal, especially from back then, in the 40s and the 50s, to the general audience that was watching these movies at the time. A lot of heroes, I can't recall names right now, but there's several heroes in movies that were originally African American and they were written in as white. Okay? The only realize also you have a lot of African American mixed with Native Indians. People, there's so many different things that people are just missing out in history. Okay. Yeah, they, they've changed the, the you know, they've changed what, how racism, in, you know, and how this, how it was used, and you know, and they continue to use it. They continue to, they continue to use it to, 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 to strangle history, to yes. to, to change history so that it fits this, this, uh, this untruthful version of what, what happened. You know, the, yes. Those I, stories do need to be retold. I think history should be just stayed out as is and let people decide for themselves what the situation is. You know, you shouldn't write history how you think someone should be thinking it or someone should be feeling it. Show the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. Even if it doesn't make you look good, show the bad. For sure. Okay, and at the same time, what will happen is you can see how much we progressed from that bad also, you see how much we need to progress even further. If the truth is going to set you free. Exactly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> it's going to set you. Well, we, we we try to tell. I try to tell the truth on the facts. It's kind of. I've noticed. <laughs> I've <have> noticed. Because <laughs> uh, I, I think it's very important. I mean, it, it it makes me. If I feel like I understand something better than I understood it before, I can sleep better that night. You know, and that's a. Unless it, it's that's it's some lie that I've ingested and made me feel better, you know. I'm, that, that's I'm sure that happens, but usually it's 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 some the next layer of understanding something that. So right there, you just said the magic word that I noticed. Not too many people, I don't know if it's because of ego or pride or whatever. You just said as long as you learn something new. Okay, mm -hmm. you're talking about learning. The day we stop learning is the day we stop living. Okay, the only way we could progress is to keep learning, even if it's a small little fact. And some people have this thing they can never be wrong, or you see it all the time, oh God forbid, you hit they might be wrong about one small little speck of a fact, and they go ballistic. Me, my mindset is, okay, you know, if I had a thought of something and you could put me wrong on it, good. This way I learned something new. I learned where I was wrong about something, and I take that knowledge and I add it to my arsenal of knowledge. It makes me a better person. I don't care about being wrong or right. I want to care about what I know correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not threatened by it. Exactly. We don't have no concept of how much time is passed for this show. Oh, we have to, we have. <laughs> well, the first two, um, I know the first one, you were definitely under time. I was like, oh, maybe a little more time this. I looked at the um, stopwatch. And no, you I, got, under, a, and I, I like, got no watch here. We have to go 27 <laughs> minutes, and we don't know how much time we, we've gone. We, nobody's timed it, right? What, how it, in, in a way, how it, it, makes, it, it makes a very rich experience. Yeah. Um, there's been amazing, you know, obviously there's War of the Worlds, the original radio broadcast that sent almost the entire nation into a panic uh, is a great example of the, pow the way people connected with radio one-on-one. -on -one. And that's the thing. It's supposed to be a more personal local medium. There are a lot more local radio programs across the country than there are TV programs. TV is most, mostly national nationally targeted programs you know you have uh -huh. what's produced by a network uh what's produced by production houses for either to go to network and then syndicate or go straight to syndication radio you have a lot more local programming 
you know, throughout the day, even though that's starting to disappear with, you know, the development of radio networks and they're beginning to do the same thing to cut costs. But there's still that local element that helped radio survive the development of television that's still present and that still connects with a lot of people. So you're, you're, you're looking for work, right? Is it, is it hard to find? It's obviously, it's really hard to find work. Yeah, it's, it's really tough because of, you know, especially in radio, which is where I've been looking. I've been looking elsewhere in TV and in college athletics, working with sports teams there, because that's what I did part-time in college. Uh, but, I mean, radio particularly, there have been so many layoffs in recent years uh, by the big companies that own a lot of the local stations that they can that even stations in the you know really small markets can be very choosy in terms of the amount of experience you know and you know skills that they want their empl- you know their employees to have before they hire them because you know so many people are looking for work that they can you know it's a it's a buyer's market so people going out into a particular field right now have to find ways to get that experience when they don't have that experience and, and, and stay alive at the same time while they're doing that. Yeah. Yeah. How European. So, uh, well, I don't know. Hmm. What else should we say? I, I think that's... Um, what kind of problems have you encountered? Well, you, we already talked about that. The, 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 well, lighting. Understaffing, lighting. Yeah, lighting uh, can sometimes be an issue depending on a uh, you know blocking where people are in the frame. Uh, but lighting really, on this show is lighting on this show can be depending on uh, what's going on. But really, the biggest issue I uh, that I think we've always run into is uh, when there's a lot of people playing at the same time. You know, getting the sound right and getting it just right so that the sound equipment doesn't interfere. Yeah, my bad. Interfere with the uh, visual composition, and you know, managing to combine that with you know, you know, a decent. Uh, uh, God, what's the word? Manage to get good sound quality in spite of that, because because if you think about that first, it can really screw up your sound quality. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I go around here saying audio's king, audio's king. You know, but yeah. I don't mean to make anybody lesser, but. It really is, because you can get away with a lot if you have good audio. <laughs> and you, yes, yeah. it's very important. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Ciao. Ciao. How did you come up with this concept with the, with the facts of the music show? It, I mean, we've been, the particular group that does the facts, we've been working together on and off for maybe 10 years. And uh, because the music is so... Um, what can I say, modern, so unusual, so many people don't like it, uh, and, uh, but I, that's not going to stop me. <laughs> and uh, so I started to put, um, I started to do little, uh, tell little stories in between pieces of music to try to give, uh, to try to give the music some kind of, uh, give the audience some kind of points of reference in this, in this kind of far out stuff. Right. And, um, and then I, I, I also am quite taken with movies, Hollywood movies, these kind of seamless ways one, one piece goes into another. So with this group of musicians, we worked uh, to develop this way to go from improvisation to a composed piece of music with seamlessly, or that, that's at least what we're trying to do, fairly seamlessly. Or if there's a seam there, it sort of fits right in. It's, right. Not, it's not like we stop and we say, because mu- music, you, you have to count down. Somebody has to call the tempo. So we had to find a way to to, to have the tempo called, uh, but that fits into this this through line of action, and um, and so out of that, and then maybe from live performances where you didn't want people to leave, so you just kept going because they so they couldn't leave, you know, <laughs> and uh, and then. Um, and then making, and, and it's still a work in progress, you know, because this, it, it, this, this series is giving me a real chance to develop these ideas, develop this form. And uh, so making this, uh, this 
these these 27 minute you know like tableaus you know that have music and have this and have that but it's like a, a painting sort of uh, and uh, and it's one piece and uh, and it, it, it kind of answers simultaneously many of my interests you know at the same time and then throwing in these discussions you know I get to meet these people and you know find out stuff and but anyway the format of the music uh, it just it grew out of you know trying to get along better with the audience and then also uh, it, ha it, it then it developed a life of its own uh, and um, So we're going to continue doing that because you know, and building and make it more asymmetrical, not so symmetrical, and and um, and the people that I play with, you know, they're pretty good improvisers, and they Cheer they know. And one of them, Andrew, he says, "We always know when to stop." Well, we don't always know when to stop, but that's the problem with improvisation: is that you can really be enjoying it, but is the audience enjoying it? You know, so I I, I try to make them really short and right. and. Um, and relevant, and uh, so that that's always my goal in art. So that nothing is there, sort of, just for the heck of it. It's it's there because it's it's meaningful. And I started as an actor before I was a musician, and I did this okay. piece. The last piece I did as an actor was a piece by Samuel Beck. It's a 45-minute monologue that I worked on for five years. I used to feel like the inside of my body was dying, and. Um, <laughs> But one of the things I got from this was that this guy had nothing in there, no and, if, but, no comma, that wasn't justified from several different directions. Everything was there for several purposes. So the thing was sort of organic, like a tree, you know, it, 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 it there's no, uh, no dress up, no, no, no extra stuff. It's. And that's my goal, and 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 to and to tell the truth, which is scary, you know, and hard. And it, it doesn't it doesn't get less scary so far, <laughs> or less hard. Um, it just, um, but it's quite rewarding. <laughs>